We start tonight uh, with an exclusive story about the whole purpose of politics in the first place. Uh, the reason to seek public office, the reason to get elected in the first place, what your job is if you win an election, is that you get to make policy. And the whole point of making policy is supposedly to address problems in our country. Here is a sample problem. Uh, Mississippi, the great state of Mississippi, has health trouble. Heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States, while the highest rate of heart disease death in the country is in Mississippi. Diabetes, also a massive American health problem. Alabama and Mississippi, it turns out, are neck and neck on being the worst for diabetes. The most recent nationwide stats put Alabama at 50 out of 50 states and Mississippi at 49th. The really astonishing number, though, in Mississippi is infant mortality. For every 1,000 kids born in the United States, how many of those kids do not live to their first birthday? Uh, overall, this is the rate in the country for infant mortality. Here's what it is in Mississippi. Hmm. Mississippi has the worst infant death rate in the country. Not only is Mississippi the worst in the country, if Mississippi were a country, it would rank below Sri Lanka and below Botswana. It would be 83rd in the world in terms of infant mortality. And if you look internally at what's going on in Mississippi, what explains that problem, you end up very quickly realizing that the issue is in racial disparity. Uh, these are Mississippi's own numbers. This is infant mortality for white mothers in Mississippi. That's the infant mortality rate in Mississippi over time. And this is the infant mortality rate, that red line there, for African-American mothers in Mississippi. So white mothers in Mississippi, they have roughly the same rate as the rest of the country. But the reason Mississippi is the worst in the country, the reason Mississippi has worse than Botswana's infant mortality rate is because African-American women have more than double the infant mortality rate of white women there. And it makes the state the worst in the country. This is a real problem. This is a life and death problem. And it has been bad in Mississippi for a long time. Now, to Mississippi's credit, they have decided to make this a priority. They are working on this. Uh, the state health department has elevated the issue so that the state can work on it in a concentrated way. Uh, the state epidemiologist, the chief nurse of the state, the office of health data in the state, the state health officer, they're all putting together reports specifically on this problem, reports to the state legislature, so the policymakers in the state legislature can try to fix this problem. The most recent report shows that they believe they've brought their horrible infant mortality rate down. They say they've got it down below 10. Uh, it's still awful. It's still one of the worst in the country. But when the next nationwide stats come out, Mississippi may no longer be the worst in the country anymore because they're working on it. But they still need to keep working on it. And lucky for Mississippi, on their state board of health, which decides policy direction for the state on health issues, it's the board that appoints that state health officer, that appoints the state's overall health plan, that approves the state's overall health plan for its overall health policies. Luckily, on that board, Mississippi is lucky enough to have somebody uniquely qualified to understand and help the state address this issue that the state really, really wants to address. Uh, his name is Carl Reddix. He grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi. He went to the Northeast for his education. He got his medical degree at Tufts. Uh, he went to Harvard to do a master's in public health. So he has a public health background, which in this case may be just as critical as having an MD as being a practicing doctor. Uh, he also, though, went, went to Johns Hopkins, to the Johns Hopkins. He did his residency there as an OBGYN. And then after all that, God bless Mississippi, luckily for his home state, this incredibly talented, perfectly well-qualified, highly educated, Harvard and Johns Hopkins trained African-American son of Mississippi, OBGYN, he decided to go home and to practice in his home state. He could have practiced anywhere in the country. He would have been a star wherever he went with that kind of a background. He decided to go home and practice in Jackson, Mississippi. And then, yes, the state's Republican governor, Haley Barber, last year appointed him, appointed Dr. Reddix to be on that state board of health. Given the problems that Mississippi is facing and given what they are trying to fix in terms of policy, somebody like Dr. Reddix has to be seen by the state of Mississippi as just a godsend. You'd think, right? The new Republican administration in Mississippi has just fired him. He had been serving Mississippi on that health board since last July, but the new Republican lieutenant governor in Mississippi has now blocked his Senate confirmation process and insisted that he be taken off this state board. The lieutenant governor, who you see there on the right, says he wants the state to instead pick a, quote, qualified doctor to help guide state health policy. Because being a born and bred Mississippian, Harvard and Johns Hopkins trained OBGYN with a master's in public health means you're not qualified? 
Not anymore. Not in Mississippi. Not in 2012. Not in Republican politics today. At least not in this iteration of Republican politics today. The reason Mississippi has taken this doctor out of the health policy process that rather desperately needs him in Mississippi is because one of the consultancies that Dr. Reddix has is with the Jackson Women's Health Organization. Dr. Reddix does not perform abortions. He is not paid by the Jackson Women's Health Organization. But if a woman is having an abortion or any other kind of procedure at that clinic and there is a complication and something goes wrong and that woman needs to be admitted to the hospital, Dr. Reddix has agreed to take over care of that woman when she gets to the hospital. Dr. Reddix says this almost never happens. But what this means in practical terms is that if there ever is a complication, a woman doesn't just get dumped into the emergency room at a local hospital. She gets admitted to the hospital under the care of this qualified, experienced, highly trained physician. That's it. That's the scandal. And Mississippi's Republican governor and lieutenant governor have decided that because of that, he cannot be on the Board of Health. He cannot participate in health policy. His public service is not wanted by the state of Mississippi. He has been fired. And now, on the State Board of Health in Mississippi, which has the worst infant mortality rate in the country, among its many other problems, which has a huge racial disparity specifically in its horrible infant mortality problem, now in the state of Mississippi, thanks to this year's garden variety anti-abortion Republican politics, there is no African-American medical doctor and there is no OBGYN on the State Board of Health. And for the record, that one remaining clinic that provides abortion services in the state of Mississippi is in danger of being shut down thanks to a new law signed by the state's Republican governor targeting that clinic with new regulations that do not apply to any other clinic in the state and that are designed specifically to shut that clinic down. This is new. This is new. And, and nobody in the country has been able to explain why this brand new thing is happening. It's not that the Republican Party or even the whole state of Mississippi was not conservative on these issues before. I mean, Haley Barber was a radically anti-abortion politician. He always has been. But even he did not take it so far as to take a well-qualified doctor who doesn't do abortions and kick him out of public service in Mississippi. What happened in Republican politics between last year and this year to put anti-abortion ideological fervency above all other policy goals in this state? And in other states, what happened in one year? The Republican Party has long been on the right on this issue, but there has been a drastic rightward lurch just in this last election cycle, which even as we have been reporting on it for the last year, has yet to be explained to me by anybody. And the partisan divide on this right now is that Democrats are starting to ask, why is this happening on the Republican side? Why is it the Republicans have lurched so suddenly and so far in women's issues? Democrats are starting to ask that. And on the Republican side, in Republican politics, I think the reason we haven't had an answer, we haven't had an explanation, is because Republicans are still in the mode of denying that it is happening. Here's how that looked in presidential politics today. Notice anything interesting about this picture? Mitt Romney, the Republican presidential candidate, speaking today in Chantilly, Virginia, in what was staged managed to look like an all-female event. Blessed art thou among women, Mr. Romney. <laughs> Mr. Romney uh, also taking to doing many of his national media availabilities now while seated next to his wife, as if she is his running mate. The campaign plainly trying to create a stylistic image of Mitt Romney as a person who is comfortable around persons of the female persuasion. But even as they are taking such great pains uh, to bend over backwards, to put Mitt Romney on camera in the company of women, to show him as being a person who is around females, even as they recognize plainly that they need to be doing this, even as they recognize that they need to be doing this, they are still not working on policy. They are still not working on policy. They are still, even as they, they focus on issues relating to women and the economy, they are, for example, refusing to say whether or not Mitt Romney would have signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. They're refusing to say whether or not he would have signed the Paycheck Fairness Act. That's another bill aimed at trying to ensure that women get equal pay for equal work. It was blocked the last time it came up uh, in the Senate by the Republicans filibustering it. Mr. Romney's campaign apparently feeling no pressure at all to say whether he supports that measure. They don't feel any pressure. It's just policy after all. That's not what this is about. This year, after decades of totally non-controversial bipartisan support, 31 male Republican senators voted against the Violence Against Women Act, and it now faces an uncertain future in the Republican-controlled House. 
And they keep going after abortion rights and reproductive rights specifically. Last week, even in the midst of pounding the podium, literally John Boehner pounding the podium, saying that the idea that there is a war on women is a fabrication, even as that was happening, more than 60 Republicans in the House were introducing another federal anti-abortion bill, another one. Republicans have also introduced a new 24-hour waiting period for women seeking abortions nationwide. They've also introduced a new time restriction on when you are allowed to get an abortion in Washington, D.C., over which Congress has some jurisdiction. They also introduced a national forced ultrasound bill. So, like the one in Virginia that made Bob McDonnell famous, except this time House Republicans want it for the whole country. They tried to block medical schools from being able to teach how to perform an abortion to doctors in training. They threatened to shut down the whole government over trying to defund Planned Parenthood. They launched their whole witch hunt investigation of Planned Parenthood. H.R. 3, the third thing they did, their third bill, it was, it was repeal Obamacare and then something else, and then H.R. 3, the third bill, the third thing they introduced when they took over the House was an anti-abortion bill. It's policy. Policy, policy, policy. And it's not style. It's not personnel. It's not chromosomes. It's policy. Republicans have always been conservatives on these issues, but this fervency is new. This pushing it to the top of the agenda is new and as yet unexplained. Even in Mississippi, in deeply, deeply conservative Republican Mississippi, being against abortion rights is nothing new. But being so fervently and urgently and desperately against abortion rights that you would stretch that idea into blackballing a well-qualified doctor's public service to his state, this is new. Why is this happening now? What is pushing this to happen now? Joining us now is Dr. Carl Reddix. He is an OBGYN practicing in Jackson, Mississippi. He was an acting board member of the Mississippi State Board of Health. Dr. Reddix, thank you very much for being here tonight. I really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you for having me. You were appointed to the State Board of Health by Governor Haley Barber. Um, can I ask how you found out uh, that the new governor, Governor Bryant, and the new lieutenant, lieutenant governor were having you removed from that board? Well, I had I found out at the uh, 11th hour, <clears throat> late Tuesday afternoon, a week ago, uh, while calling to try to ascertain when my confirmation hearing was going to be. I'd been asking for over a month uh, such that I can schedule and make sure that the uh, my time was um, available and I was not out of town <clears throat> such that um, I would uh, be available to uh, Present myself in front of the uh, our state senate and uh, and sit for confirmation. Uh, unfortunately, no one knew when that confirmation hearing was going to be. Uh, they told me that historically they did it the last uh, week of of our legislative session, uh, which is this current week. Uh, so last Tuesday, I was really uh, <clears throat> trying hard to try and figure out when this hearing was going to be, and uh, had. The uh, state health officer and her uh, legislative liaison looking for the date and time, uh, getting in touch with the Senate uh, chairman of, of the uh, Public Health Committee uh, to no avail. And uh, so I had my uh, some, some politician friends that I know, both in the Senate and the House, and uh, unfortunately for me, uh, Representative uh, Robert Johnson, uh, state representative from Natchez, uh, informed me that he had talked with the uh, Senate chairman and that my confirmation was being pulled at the 11th hour by the lieutenant governor. Uh, he had every, the, uh, he, the, uh, the uh, Senate chairman had every intention on having the uh, confirmation hearing this past Tuesday, and he was told that my uh, confirmation hearing was pulled. And so while on the phone with uh, Representative Johnson, I got a call from the um, Associated Press reporter uh, asking me why my nomination had been pulled. So uh, obviously uh, you're dismayed and, and, uh, and outraged at the prospect of a major uh, governmental institution not uh, having enough decorum to allow a fairly simple uh, process to move forward. So it was uh, strictly from, really I got more information from the reporter uh, because she had already uh, interviewed folks in the uh, Lieutenant Governor's office and the Governor's office and, uh, and from her 
investigation, it seemed to have come from uh, the 11th hour uh, and by the lieutenant governor and not by uh, our governor. As obviously you were appointed to this post by uh, the previous governor of Mississippi, by Governor Haley Barber, uh, himself a Republican, um, somebody who is uh, uh, not in favor of abortion rights as a politician. This was your your association with this clinic in Mississippi uh, was not an issue for Haley Barber, um, but it became an issue all of a sudden for the current administration in the state. As a as a born and bred Mississippian, as somebody who has an OBGYN, has seen these politics firsthand. Do you feel like you've seen anything that explains this kind of this 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 sudden change, this sort of newfound militancy in, in state politics on this issue that seems to have cost you the seat on this board? Well, yeah, I've never had the opportunity to sit for confirmation, so I can't uh, honestly answer that question. Although I can say that the um, you know obviously this is we've got new state. Uh, um, statewide elected officers both uh, in the uh, in all the the top five uh, state offices and um, so you know you, you would think that part of it is just because it's, it's new to them and our lieutenant governor uh, has not spent any time in the Senate he was not uh, his previous office was state treasurer so I you know the uh, the issue is uh, you know how much uh, control that one person has. I mean, if the state senator uh, who's charged with the committee that o of oversight uh, for confirmation, my uh, uh, background had already been checked by the state legislature, so all, everything was cleared. And uh, and for the lieutenant governor to uh, independently uh, just pull, you know, do a pocket veto on my nomination. I'm not sure that uh, you know if it has happened before or not. Certainly, uh, no one that that I knew had ever gone through that. And um, and as I was preparing uh, to be in a hearing this week to find out that uh, that it had been pulled uh, a week ago, is uh, and, and nobody from from the state capitol or the governor's office have made any contact with me to uh, to offer any explanation uh, for why this has happened and. Uh, uh, so it, it is it is total dismay and outrage on my part. Dr. Carl at Reddix, the process. Dr. Carl Reddick's member of the Mississippi State Board of Health, being ousted now uh, by the Republican governor there. Thank you uh, for joining us tonight, sir. I, I, I'm I, I feel like this has uh, run its course, but to the extent that this continues uh, in the state, I hope you stay uh, in touch with us and let us know um, how this pans out, sir. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Okay.